We yeah, continued yeah. and You know, I can What's we have of this maximum. and That's not in the name of our workshop. Hello. Very nice to see you all. The familiar face is always here. Yeah, you are in Atlanta, right? That's right, yeah. Hello, Joanne. Good to see you. Hi, hi. Good morning, Dario. Love your voice. You know, that's so familiar to me. Great to see you. Yeah. I'm playing with some background to, to illustrate the points for discussion. Okay. Uh, where are you now? In, uh, in China or in uh, Georgia? I'm in Hong Kong. Great. And, uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Where, um, you know, 
works everything. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, hello, Professor Fang. This is Xian Hong. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm supposed to be the moderator for this session, but uh, I'm literally late for a few minutes. Um, so, uh, shall we start? It's 9.30. Oh, it's 9.30 oh, in Beijing. Okay, let me... Uh, it's uh, 8.15. I, think, I, think actually, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Uh, so could you please all mute it and then we can only have one person to talk uh, when you are uh, unmuted. So uh, me, Professor Fong, let me just uh, start by announcing the opening of this uh, session. Welcome to this very interesting working group actually organized by my friend, uh, Dr. Fang on the screen. And since they cannot travel to China to, to from China to here, so I just mm -hmm. uh, help with the moderation. And my name is Xian Hong. I'm from UNESCO, but here I'm really a friend uh, of uh, our stakeholders in China. So first, uh, we all know this session focused on the role of governments, the government's role in the internet uh, governance. I like to invite uh, the, the 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 organizer of this session. Dr. Fang, who is the best positioned to uh, explain why we're having this session, what's the question he'd like to tackle with our excellent panel here, and also to trigger discussion with each of you in the room. So, um, Fang Boshi, uh, could you please take the floor, Dr. Fang, from there? Uh, uh, okay. okay, so uh, so I will just explain to our uh, audiences here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Professor Fang uh, informed that uh, he has prepared some uh, speaking points, which was already translated to English, uh, because he uh, he prefer uh, his assistant to deliver it in English directly because we don't have the interpretation in the room. So, uh, Yuan Yuan, could you please take the floor to deliver the inputs from Dr. Fang in English? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, many thanks for your interest in the workshop. Uh, the following words was written by Dr. Fang and uh, uh, translated to English by his words. So uh, this uh, workshop is co-hosted uh, by College of Media and International Culture, uh, Zhejiang University, uh, Wujian Institute of Digital Civilization, and the Penn State University. Uh, with support from School of Cyber Science and Technology, and also Center of Public uh, Diplomacy and the Strategic, uh, strategic Communication uh, of Georgia University. The workshop uh, uh, will be moderated on site by Ms. Uh, who, who you have already met. So, so that you see you all to get, get together at IGF. Uh, the theme of the workshop is uh, about the role uh, the government should play in the new area, in the new era, uh, which originally popped into my head because a series of major events in the past three years, such as uh, the pandemic, the US-China technology war, internet antitrust, and the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, have caused tremendous impacts on our lives and brought disruptive effects to the global uh, cyberspace. The return of the government has been an important feature of the new uh, paradigm of global internet governance. The Digital Markets Act positions the super internet platform 
as the gatekeeper of the digital era, while the government, which has long played the role of night watchman in the past, have become the gatekeeper's gatekeeper. As digital technology continues to be deeply involved in daily life, the government, which has a, mon a monopoly on public power, will undoubtedly, undoubtedly need to play a more active and crucial role. Otherwise, the order will be unsustainable. Well, at the same time, as seen in events such as the tech conflict and the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, the powerful power of the government will also have a more destructive effect if it's not restrained. Here are some of my simple thoughts about the future of the global cyberspace and the future role of the government. Uh, there is a need for the new fundamental theories to be structured, uh, a new uh, theoretical a system of global internet governance. The second, IGF, WSIS, GDE, and uh, G20, and other uh, mechanisms should play a better role. And also, there is a need to have more in-depth communication uh, mechanisms. Third, the interdisciplinary academic community should play a more active role the scientific community is the creator of the internet and also the best guardians of cyberspace. Fourth, major countries must, must cooperate to avoid conflicts. We need cooperation rather than confliction. Uh, to governments, how to play a positive role and inhabit the negative side, how to complement the multi stakeholder. Uh, model and figure out what to do and what can can't do has become the primary issue in global cyberspace. Thinkers here are the most qualified and uh, original thinkers in the field of internet governance. And I'm I'm looking forward to hearing your your ideas and discussion to this new challenge. I hope we can all meet offline at the next year's idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuan Yuan. Thank you, Dr. Fang, for your wonderful uh, setting the scene for this di discussion. As you may know that my friend uh, Dr. Fang has been a leading entrepreneur and leading advocate and leading researcher of internet governance in China. I'm so appreciative of you uh, being able to uh, get in this workshop uh, approved and also managed in this uh, manner, which really tackled the crucial issue, not only for IGI, but also really for the internet higher uh, global internet the governance about the how we uh, further enhance the role of uh, governments. So uh, I'd like to introduce our panel here. Basically, we are having uh, we are having five speakers. Uh, first one is Henriette. You all know her, right? The IGF girl, and uh, you were the first. And then second, we have the we have Professor Milton Milton Miller uh, remotely participating. And then we have the Jovan uh, Kabalia uh, from the the founding director of Diplo Foundation, also well known to the IGF community. I think uh, you are also remotely there. And then we have um, uh, Professor Wolfgang Kleiwaster, another <laughs> Another celebrity I don't need to introduce so 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 well because everybody knows you, Professor Wolfgang. And the last one, but not the least, is Professor Zhongbu, uh, my compatriot researcher living in the United States. Uh, he is a professor in the uh, department head of the uh, uh, of uh, interactive media uh, of the School of Communication at the uh, at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Before he came to Hong Kong, he worked as a professor uh, at the Donald uh, Balasario College of Communication in Pennsylvania State University in the US. So I have a strong panel, so let me, I will be very brief. I want to uh, reship our scenario as I sent you before. Uh, I sent you two questions. I intended to have two round of intervention, but since we are lagging behind, I like our speaker, can you please uh, combine your uh, intervention to tackle 
um, two questions in one intervention. So we can have some time to uh, open the floor to allow for questions, comments, sharing views from the audiences in the room, since it's only one hour, we already have half an hour have, um, uh, passed. So two key questions here is, first one, so what kind of role you think government play in the internet governance and what are the major challenges need to be that need to be made by the government in the new need need to be tackled by the government in the new situation and uh, as dr fang already set out the scene in his uh, speech and what should the government do and what it cannot do so uh, it's a question of to be and not to be. That's the first question. And then second question that uh, building on your perception of role of the government and the challenges and uh, from the geopolitical uh, aspect, uh, what do you think of the role of those big players, uh, big countries such as uh, China, the US, the Europe, and uh, the, maybe the, Af the Africa, um, whatever, pick an example you like to uh, make your case. What do you think of those uh, big players big countries role in the internet governance and what should be their top priority issues and actions i think everyone would have five minutes if you could maybe you can run to six minutes and i will be a very tough moderator i'm looking at my watch so uh shall i invite Henriette to deliver your intervention first please um, thank you Zhang hong i was hoping to go after Milton, <laughs> but um I'll try and be very brief. Um, and actually, I think we shouldn't overcomplicate this question or the answers. The role of governments is primarily, and you actually find this in the, the WISIS documents, it's to create an enabling environment. So it's to create an enabling environment for, for internet development, for growth, for innovation, for people to use the internet, for culture, for entertainment, for education. Um, but then it's also the role of government as a duty bearer to promote and respect human rights. This is part of our international system. It's actually a cornerstone of the international system. And I think when we're looking at government playing an in enabling environment in the context of internet governance, that role with regard to human rights is part of it. Of course, it's not a simple role, um, and but it's a role that, that involves government making sure that its own actions promote and respect human rights, but also to hold other actors, non-state actors, including corporations, accountable for upholding and respecting human rights. Secondly, what are the major, you, you didn't just ask two questions, by the way, Shang Kong. Secondly, um, what are the major challenges to be met? Um, um, I think, uh, well, I'll, before I go to conflict, I'll just talk about, I think we are in a context at the moment where there's a much more awareness of potential harm that happens on the internet, um, of of the the threats of insecurity, um, ransomware attacks, you know, conflict, cyber conflict. I think there's a risk here that governments overreach. Of course, governments have to to address these harms, but and these threats, they do not have to address them by regulating the internet. I think we forget that the internet is a platform and that if there is any kind of need for regulatory intervention, it should be done very carefully and targeting those that operate on the internet in the same way that we have market regulation. Why do we need market regulation? To ensure um, competition to protect the public interest. So I think there's a real risk here that because the internet seems to be no longer just a positive um, aspect that governments are overreacting and overregulating and regulating in a way that doesn't necessarily provide the solutions that could create more problems. Then your question about the challenges and the tension, I think that, that it really disturbs me. I think that we are finding that the spirit of, of collaborative internet governance that we have been trying to grow in the IGF and in the post WISA scenario um, in bodies like ICANN and the, you know, but in other spaces as well, that we seem to be entering a space of polarization um, where disagreements and different approaches between different states, which are not new, you know, these are not new to us. The multi-stakeholder approach, for example, has never been universally accepted or even universally understood across countries. 
um, how we interpret human rights and how different states apply human rights also differs. Um, so it disturbs me that rather than accepting that there are these differences and trying to work through them to build more commonality and, and establish common ground, that we are actually polarizing. And there's a discourse of like-minded countries uh, against non-like-minded countries. And that instead of actually maintaining this overall emphasis on striving towards collaborative global internet governance. We are fragmenting how we're talking about internet governance between North and South, West and East, in a way that I think is not very helpful. And that touches on your last question, the role of the big players. I think the role of the big players should be to talk to one another, to bring other stakeholders into the conversations. And instead of every big player developing its own set of principles, its own declaration for the future of the internet, let's work together. And I'm hoping that I am, I, I am sometimes optimistic that maybe the Global Digital Compact does provide an opportunity for us to get back into that space where we recognize there are differences, but we don't allow that to stop us striving towards at least talking about common principles and still working together, even if there are, are different approaches and different interpretations. Thank you, Arietta, for the wonderful remarks. Uh, now I'm inviting our second speaker, Professor Milton Mueller from online. Could you please take the floor? Professor sure. Newton. Thank you very much, Shen Long. It's good to see you again, uh, even from a very far distance. Um, when I read the, the main question you wrote, I was a little bit uh, puzzled. Uh, it says, uh, what role should the government play in internet governance? And when I hear that, I think, uh, which government? Right? Which government are we talking about? Because the internet is a, an integrated global cyberspace. And uh, each of these governments, uh, and one of the big problems of internet governance is that each government is sovereign, each national government is sovereign, and they have different uh, values, they have different uh, political institutions, and uh, they have different interests. So it's, um, the question is really, what can government do uh, to govern the internet that is not going to fragment it. And I think Anna touched on some of those points in an interesting way. I don't agree that without gov more government, there will be less order or no order. The, the internet has evolved as a very orderly space, uh, at least technically, uh, through private sector and civil society activities, through standard setting, through technical evolution, uh, and through, you know, voluntary choice to who to avoid, what to stop, what to block. So don't think that all order uh, rests uh, upon the forcible and territorial governance of, of nation states. A lot of the order comes from different, different sources. Um, in fact, you could say that the major source of disorder in cyberspace today is actually coming from government. I'm talking about offensive cyber operations. I'm talking about export controls. I'm talking about uh, technological cold wars uh, and various forms of possible intervention in, in human rights and human speech. So one of the most important things a government can do in the current role is to leave certain forms of global governance that require global compatibility to the private sector. I'm talking here about the unique identifiers, the coordination of unique identifiers. I'm talking about routing of packets. I'm talking about uh, public key infrastructure and the certification, the digital certificates and the verification of digital certificates that is so important to security. Those are things that governments have to leave alone to global uh, private sector operators. Now, what can governments do? I think they can do a number of things. They can foster an open and competitive market in internet service and in cloud and software. They can prosecute effectively cyber criminals, which means that they have to cooperate and harmonize their rules with other governments. And as part of this harmonization process, I'm talking about free trade agreements, 
I'm talking about cyber conflict norms that they can try to adhere to. I'm talking about data sharing with law enforcement agencies from other states. Or I'm talking about the recognition and protection of internationally recognized human rights. So in terms, uh, I'll be very brief here, uh, in terms of what major changes need to be made. <laughs> Uh, that could be the topic of uh, an hour of talk, but uh, I would just emphasize two things. Number one is stop trying so hard to control content. And I mean this not just for what we call authoritarian countries uh, like China and Russia, but also countries in the US uh, or Europe where we're, we're trying too hard to, we're putting too much faith in suppression and too little faith in the ability of people to sort out truth from falsehood and to uh, make their own choices about who they want to associate with and who they want to believe. And another thing I'd, I would advocate is to uh, do more to allow end-to-end -end encryption uh, to, to protect the privacy and confidentiality of, of users on the internet. There are too many governments that simply do not allow it. And again, even the liberal democracies of the West are constantly battling over whether they should undermine encryption or not. So to wrap up, what about the big players? <laughs> well, I would identify the US, China, Europe, and India as having the most critical role simply because of the size of their populations and their markets. And I would identify the US-China conflict as probably the most damaging and negative thing that's happening now in internet governance. Uh, the, it's, it's tragic the way the US is uh, shutting out China. Uh, there are reasons for uh, the US to be upset with uh, China's barriers to trade and to free expression. But for the US to claim that uh, telecom equipment and TikTok are national security threats is, is ridiculous and it militarizes the debate in a way that is very not helpful. So the US and China need to uh, pacify their relationship. They need to uh, re-engage in uh, open trade with each other, uh, both in commodities and in services. And um, they, we need to avoid the polarization of the rest of the world around this U.S.-China axis. Uh, Europe and India also are, are very important. I think that uh, Europe tries to play a role as a big human rights defender, but um, I think it's like uh, like Andre had suggested. It's becoming too regulatory, and it is becoming uh, dangerously in favor of this idea of digital sovereignty, which is a an exclusionary and um, a fragmentary uh, approach to internet governance. Uh, India also is suffering from nationalistic tendencies and protectionist tendencies. So I think uh, all four of these big players need to get together and uh, recommit to uh, free trade in internet services and uh, to the desecuritization or, or to the pacification of, of internet governance among them. That's all for now. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. For being so efficient, actually, you have answered all my so-called two, but actually eight questions in such a short uh, six minutes. And also, I'd like to say that's uh, happy to hear your very pleasant laughter from the other side of the continent. Thank you. So next speaker is Jovan uh, Kubalija. Uh, Jovan, could you please take the floor uh, from online? Sure, sure. Thank you. And uh, it's really my honor to be uh, part of this panel. And I will uh, build up, uh, build the further on the two uh, previous presenters, but making one, uh, uh, two broader reflections. One is uh, of anchoring out any of discussion in reality, including the reality of this call, which was possible through the cable, which you can see behind me, going from Djibouti towards Europe and towards East. Therefore, uh, internet uh, sometimes is confused with so many uh, empty terms, so many slogans, internet governance. But in reality, we have to get to back to basics. And I think around this, 
transfer of exactly these packets which are carrying, carrying uh, my video or Milton or others, you can analyze more or less all internet governance and uh, role of public governance, uh, pub, uh, role of governments, including protection of these cables, which is one of the big issues. They are not protected, and there is a missing international law, effective international law. But when, you, when I received the invitation for this call, uh, um, and I found the Leviathan in the title, I said, okay, that's uh, basically uh, important reflection on uh, the time in which we live and what we're trying to do. And we are basically negotiating new digital social contracts. It is indication which was in the National by Secretary General in digital compact discussion. And in this digital social compact, we are answering very simple question, which Tom, the Thomas Hobbes tried in Leviathan, what is the role of government in citizen and what is the deal between governments and citizens? And uh, it wasn't only him who did it. Uh, there were other great, uh, great uh, thinkers of that uh, era, like uh, Rousseau, Locke, and uh, they were basically trying to see, to understand what is the deal between government and citizens. In Leviathan, as we know, we as a citizen, we pass uh, authority, legitimacy to Leviathan, to government, to protect us from. Uh, anarchy and, uh, and, and the risk that society brings. But what is very important, and with this I will conclu uh, conclude this short intro, uh, there, have, there have been thinkers all over the world, including uh, this gentleman on the screen behind me, uh, historical thinkers, Chinese philosopher, Shan Yang, Confucius, Lao Tse. You have the same thing in African traditions, you have the same th thing in traditions all over the world. Maybe not codified in the books, on the writings, but ultimately they've been trying to answer this question. Now, the problem that we face today is that we're trying to answer this question of, of uh, relation between government and society in the rather specific uh, uh, time and era, well, essentially, nobody can effectively, and I highlight effectively, answer the phone calls that citizens, companies, businesses, and, and countries face when it comes to digital reality. From simple removal of YouTube to the blockages of the of the traffic to the filtering to cybercrime, cybersecurity, and essential internet governance and digital compact. When you remove all wording and tra tra uh, trappings, is about this lady trying to find the right organization, international, private company to answer the calls that these people are, are making. Now, what is the role of governments in this context? Governments have to deliver on this basic social contract. They have to ensure security of citizens, flourishing, uh, flourishing the society, economically, politically, socially. And they cannot do it, with possible exception of two governments, but I'm not sure that even they can do it fully, United States and China. All other governments are trying to find a solution, and this is where we are today, in Internet Governance Forum and Digital Compact. Uh, if you return to this simplicity of the functions of the main stakeholders, which Tunis agenda outlined in the respective roles and uh, responsibilities, we have uh, not an easy task, but simply a task in the sense of understanding in what direction we are moving. A lot of confusion will be removed, and we will have precise, concrete, and understandable discussion to citizens. I I'm sorry, but many of citizens cannot understand what we are discussing in the Internet Governance Forum. But if you explain in this way, as I explained to a friend of mine, whose business was ruined by removing his YouTube channel, and he asked me as sort of Internet Governance expert to help him, uh, to guide him how to solve his problem. Therefore, this is a huge challenge. Governments have a major role to do in this respect, and they have responsibility, like other stakeholders. Uh, governments have been for quite a long time quite shy, uh, and uh, they are, especially after COVID, they are uh, taking over the role in the overall governance. There is a risk that they can go too far, and I, I think Andriot and Milton already outlined those major risks. But uh, that's a very tricky situation that we have to ask them to act, but to act in responsible, smart, and cautious ways. It can be applied to data governance, to artificial intelligence, to cybersecurity, to almost 
any policy policy field. And my concluding remark would be let us return to common sense and the role of the government and many questions will be simply answered. It won't be an easy process. We will need a lot of diplomacy. We will need a lot of listening. We will need a compromise and delicate trade-offs. Therefore, a uh, view that ideological view that there are only two two uh, two views, my and wrong, should be dismissed. All views should be taken uh, around the table, and only in that way we will ensure the future of this great, great network and great uh, human uh, um, um, uh, result of human creativity as the internet is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jovan, always for your wonderful remarks and even very uh, philosophical thoughts, uh, inspiring indeed. And our next speaker is Professor Wolfgang Klanwaschter. Please, Wolfgang, take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just take um, Jovan's word from the respective role uh, because, you know, this was a key uh, sentence as part of the internet governance uh, definition, which was uh, proposed by the working group on internet governance, where Jovan and I were a member and we had a long discussion about, you know, this uh, two words, respective role, because we agreed in the group that uh, the internet is too big just for one stakeholder. Uh, not only government or only the private sector, this was the conflict in the first phase of the visits, uh, who should manage the, the internet. US was in favor of the private sector, China was in favor of the government, and the proposal was made, we need all stakeholders, and then came this in their respective roles, because no stakeholder can substitute another stakeholder. The role of government is different from the role of the private sector, but government cannot substitute the private sector and government cannot substitute the civil society and civil society cannot substitute the government so the only way forward is um, working together hand in hand and in the second sentence of the definition is another key word and this is sharing uh, the definition says you know that governments private sector and civil society in their respective roles should share programs um, uh, principles, norms, and decision-making procedures. And I think this is a key point. Uh, and, and, and this leads to the way how governments collaborate with other stakeholders. So it's not a master-slave relationship that only one side decides and the other have to implement it. So we need a new quality of interaction between the various stakeholders. And uh, what we have learned in the 15, 20 years since the visits process is that there is no model which, can, which is usable for all situations. So there is no one size fits all. So the governance of uh, cybersecurity has to be rather different from the governance of, let's say, the digital uh, education. And the governance of the domain name system has to be different from uh, digital trade, the governance of digital trade. So that means we have to look uh, first to the issue and then to build the governance model around the issue and then to define what is the respective role of each stakeholder. Certainly, you know, in the field of cybersecurity, probably the government has the lead, but it would be unwise for governments not to work together with the technical community or the private sector or to uh, take into account the, the, the uh, positions of the civil society. So certainly in, in the leadership in cybersecurity, this is very understandable, uh, remains in the hand of governments. If it comes to the domain name system, you know, the leadership is in the hand of the registrars and registries and, and, and of ICANN, and governments are in an advisory capacity. So that means you have different models, and this has to be uh, built around the specifics of of a certain issue. I think this is really important in so far just to generalize the question and to say, you know, governments have to manage uh, or have to uh, uh, define, you know, or make policies for cyberspace. No, they have to share. And he, this brings me also to uh, the future. So uh, I was a little bit um, 
I would not say skeptical. When I heard this morning Amadip, when he spoke about the Global Digital Compact and said we need input from all stakeholders, but uh, this will be negotiated by governments. So I think, is this sharing? If, uh, you know, we have different, and Rete made very clear that we have a different understanding in the world what the multi-stakeholder model is. So uh, some governments uh, think, you know, okay, we consult with stakeholders and this is already multi-stakeholderism, but consultation is not really a multi-stakeholder approach. Multi-stakeholder approach goes far beyond consultation with other stakeholders. So. Here, we have to be innovative. Uh, this morning, also, you know, uh, uh, the uh, incoming ITU uh, 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 Director General referred to Kofi Annan, and it, it was Kofi Annan who made this statement in the first business and said, you know, we have to be innovative in policy making. I think the way forward is really, we need innovation in policy making. And if it comes to the Global Digital Compact, I think one big innovation, and this could be a good model and a source for inspiration, was the drafting of the Net Mundial Declaration in Sao Paulo. So uh, when the Brazilian government initiated the process for the Net Mundial Conference in Sao Paulo, nearly uh, eight years ago now, so. Uh, there was an intergovernmental committee, but then the drafting was in the hand of so-called multi-stakeholder drafting teams. And this would be my proposal for the Global Digital Compact, that uh, Amadip and the leadership team and the, uh, uh, the United Nations should identify the issues and then to create multi-stakeholder drafting teams. And then the draft could go in the final stage to the governments. And because, you know, the United Nations is in the governmental body and then they have to adopt it. But it should not be uh, left in the hand of the governments what the th single paragraphs include. We had a similar situation, situation also in Business One when uh, uh, finally the governments uh, rejected all the input which came from civil society and this led to the civil society Geneva Declaration. So finally we had two documents. It was the Geneva Declaration from governments and the civil society declaration which was equally adopted and finally in the final session handed over to the chair and the president of Business One. So we should avoid this, that we have uh, at, at the end two global digital compacts, one in the governmental global digital compact and one uh, from the, from non-state actors. So that means here we need policy innovation and, you know, the proposal would be from my side to start with uh, creation of uh, multi-stakeholder drafting teams for the seven issues which has been identified by the tech envoy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang, for such a perfect uh, framing of the role of uh, government from the aspect of multi-stakeholderism, which is such a key word here. Uh, I think our conversation would also involve the audiences from Rome. I recognize that we do have some representatives from the governments and also from uh, different stakeholders. I saw our colleague, former colleague, uh, Nigel, uh, also at the present. Uh, we are going to invite our last speaker on the panel, uh, Professor uh, Zhongbu, to share uh, his views. And then I will open the floor to allow for more uh, question answer comments from the floor. Thank you. So, Professor Zhongbu, could you please take the floor from online? Thank you very much, and, uh, uh, Ms. Xin Hong, and it's uh, my honor to join all the old friends, and we met uh, many, many times and in the past years and face-to-face, -face. but the pandemic really, uh, you know, keep us and hold on in Hong Kong. Right now, I'm in Hong Kong. It's too hot for me. I really want to get some cold weather place. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's very important to answer Xian Hong's uh, two questions. And uh, nothing is so, um, you know, obviously to us after the whole world experienced three years of pandemic. The COVID pandemic has really made us rethinking government policy's role in the digital media age. And now we know that the government policy will extend it to a various form of content and media platform. And during the pandemic, we began to realize the importance of digital media. It's increasingly central to the functioning of our society, democracy, and also help us to fight the could and you know um you know help us and to understand our areas and post-COVID recovery. 
tends to, uh, you know, government tends to regulate increasing the you know, moral platform environment, obligation, role, and responses. And uh, and this is a uh, this is like a you know uh, uh, this is a uh, I just heard some some noises here. I'm sorry. In terms of required to manage growing risk of concentration in quality, and uh, but I, I I do share with the concern our speaker previous speakers were mentioning about this stuff. We must work with stakeholders to set a policy and regulation for data protection or other things there, especially during the pandemic there. The government should also regulate transfer data across national boundary and the roles and the responsibilities in data processing value chains there. Um, but in the government control can undermine the promise to share the prosperity of the internet and the digital platform can enable scales um, economic economies but without a competitive environment, the outcome could be excessively concentration and monopolies. Um, and the digital technology really help uh, us overcome information scarcity, but governments remain uncomfortable. The outcome will be greater control rather than citizens empowerment and inclusion. So how are we providing this to reduce all these risks there? Government policy and investment in the digital media sector must be accompanied by complementary policy reforms in the non digital sector, non internet governance area, including social economic contexts, because the new knowledge and the internet governance are applied, you know, are applied, and, you know, to uh, to the to uh, you know how we're going to you know govern the internet governance. I do hear. Um, Professor Miller's, and you know, uh, concern to not try to control the contents and you know, governments everywhere do not control the government. To add on that, I like to say is like government, you should share the power and make the structure, making you know, how they go to use the internet governance most transparent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhong, for your uh, excellent uh, contribution. Actually, I thank all our panelists for being so time cautious. That's why we now have at least uh, 10 minutes to trigger discussion to share the view from our audience. I also like to keep a few minutes for our uh, panel to give a final words, particularly our uh, our colleague, um, Dr. Fang, maybe you also want to share some reaction uh, in the end. So now floor is yours, my dear uh, colleagues in the room. Uh, uh, whether you're from government or from other sectors, and please share your view about the role of the government in the internet governance, or if you'd like to comment or raise a question to the interventions just uh, given by all our panelists. Please signal to me if you, yes, the lady there, please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Julia. I'm from Russian uh, NGO organization, and I prepared one question, and maybe to all of you, I think. So, um, uh, you told a lot about the role uh, of governments to protect the human rights, uh, but uh, do we need regulation over corporations? Uh, first of all, in the field uh, over personal data security um, and the provision of their services uh, to everyone on uh, an equal basis without discrimination against uh, the certain uh, user groups. Uh, remember the beginning of the year um, when the and, and the activities of a meta company, uh, which did nothing to block calls uh, for uh, the use of violence uh, against uh, Russians and uh, allowed a cruel ads to a Russian audience. Um, I, 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 I saw that uh, on the Russian uh, segment of uh, internet. And I'll remind, that, uh, remind you that in the February of um, 2022, after special military operation started, Meta also allowed uh, online users to call violence against Russians. So, and um, the um, uh, other uh, point that what about Twitter and its former uh, leadership, uh, which uh, for years collected user data for the sake of uh, targeted advertising and uh, recall the example of Oracle, uh, which uh, generally has uh, user data for 5 billion uh, people around the world. And um, uh, as you said, uh, Professor, uh, there are many stakeholders on this, uh, that field. So maybe our goal to make a decision making uh, 
procedures uh, transparent uh, as um, as far as they could be uh, using the feedback mechanism from society and uh, these stakeholders should be uh, should take care and responsibility for people they work for um, Thank so you. my question uh, sh should we review the uh, role um, and regulation of corporation Thank you. And thank you for your question. I'm not sure it's directly linked to our subject, but I'd like to uh, 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 open floor for more audiences to share your comments and questions, and then we will handle them together in the end. Thank you. So, Nigel, please take the floor. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I'll be brief. Thank you for this session. Nigel Hickson from the uh, UK government. Just a, a couple of points, I, I, I think, really, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to hear such uh, expert speakers and people that were uh, like Wolfgang and, uh, uh, you know, that were there at the beginning, if you like, of the, some of the multi-stakeholder processes. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, that as we've gone through, uh, gone through the process of multi-stakeholderism from 2003, 2005 onwards, of course it's changed, shifted. Things evolve always in, in different circumstances. But I, I think I'd like to pick up two points, and the first one is is the is the pandemic itself, uh, which was mentioned earlier in the uh, in the intervention from the learned uh, gentleman from China at the beginning, and 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 clearly the pandemic, you know, affected it as all. It affected the role of governments, but it also affected the role of stakeholders. Uh, and I don't think UK is unique in any different countries. But what we faced in the in the UK, of course, is is working from home, delivery of public services to people that could not uh, go to hospitals or could not attend various uh, various other uh, uh, sort of health, uh, health uh, positions. And therefore, you know, the role of civil society, the role of the private sector was enhanced during that time. They had to work very closely with governments, they had to work very closely uh, with health professionals across the spectrum. And I think we saw, uh, especially in the in the overall community, how the internet companies, how the various telecommunication companies also uh, you know, stood up to the challenge to provide connectivity to a population, uh, very changed situation. And as we go forward, I'm sure that the role of stakeholders will will change again. We did have the excellent example, of course, of the Net Mondial discussions where governments and uh, a whole variety of stakeholders came together in in a, in a in a post sort of crisis situation to reevaluate where the internet is going, and we will have that opportunity again as we go forward in the WISIS Plus Twenty review process. The governments, stakeholders will come together to discuss how the internet should be fashioned for the future. I fully fully agree with Wolfgang in terms of the global digital compact. It's really excellent how the Techno Envoy has reached out uh, to a whole range of different stakeholders beyond just the people in this room, but to academics, to scientists, to all types of stakeholders. But there's one thing in reaching out, as Wolfgang said, and we learned this in government. There's one thing in reaching out and consulting. There's another in discussing what the outcomes will be. You need to be in the room for both phases. You need to be in the room to put your comments and your views forward to governments. Stakeholders have to do that. But then governments, when they're actually discussing what comes out of the process, need to be able to talk to stakeholders as well. So it, this is a very important test indeed. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nigel, for such a uh, such a insight for sharing. I can't help suggesting to Dr. Fong, maybe next time you should include Nigel to your panel on the discussion of the role of governments. It's really very insightful. And any others? Yes, gentlemen here there, please introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Jacob Odada. I'm from the Pan-African Parliament. My comment is on the fact that when we talk of government, government is a big bear. And we all know government has three arms, legislature, judiciary, and executive. And it is important that we understand the roles of these three different arms 
when you're talking about internet governance. Judiciary, you need to have an opportunity for remedial action through the courts when there's the issue of, of, of human rights abuses related to the internet. Legislature, they, the, the members of parliament need to be well aware of issues relating to internet governance for them to formulate proper policies and also to oversight the executive. Then the executive is the one that now implements the policy. But most of the time, the focus is mostly on the executive. But we forget these two other players are very key in governance because the courts are, your, are, are the place you go for your last resort. So if we don't even talk of courts in terms of internet governance, or we don't talk of uh, the role of legislature in, in policy and oversight, then we, 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 we cannot make the traction that needs to be made. Thank you. Thank you so much for making such a wonderful distinction of the government's composition. Is the, I mean, the three branches, you know, it's not that a simplistic concept. Thank you. So, yes, gentlemen there, please introduce yourself. Hello. Um, Matthew Matt Norton from an organization called the Slash Roots Foundation in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, my, my question for the, the panel, but for the group is, you know, this question is talking about re, 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 rethinking the role of governance in the context of the internet. And I was curious to the panelists, but also to the broader actors as to when we talk about this, the, the, the question is who should govern? Um, and I ask that because, you know, when it comes to the internet, we have a number of different, there are some quasi um, there are some things that are obviously owned by private sector platforms or organizations. There are some things that in a way are kind of transnational or co cooperations. And then there's other types of governance forum. But, you know, I look, I, you know, the, the, the person earlier talked a little bit about some of the challenges earlier this year with the, 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 um, the, invade, the Russian invasion and the conversation that, pre that came after that, for example, around the SWIFT network as to like how should that their decision as to whether to eject a particular country or party from that network. And there are a number of conversations that came out about that, about the risk around, well, if we start to politicize some of these internet governance mechanisms, would it then cause particular actors to then break off and start their own networks? And so I, I, I raise that question because I look at that and there are a number of other countries that were not a part of the decision making as to whether a particular country should be ejected, but might be um, have to live with the repercussions of decisions made by a very short number of actors. And so when we talk about governance and the kind of governance structure we might want to work towards, what does that potentially look like? Are we trying to replicate the kinds of things that we have in the UN system right now? Um, or are we trying to have these kind of pseudo structures that are governed by a few um, influence actors or do they remain in the kind of the realm of the private sector? So there are a number of different kinds of governance questions that I think are useful to engage with and I'd be curious to hear what the panels think. Thank you for raising such a fundamental question on who should uh, govern. I'm looking around if any other yeah, questions. I saw a lady to my right, but at the same time, I realize we have many online participants. So uh, uh, our technical support, if there are any questions from online, please signal to me as well. Thank you. So please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Giovanna. I'm here as part of the Brazilian Youth Delegation, and I'm currently working at the Rio de Janeiro City Hall. And I, so I have a question for the panelists. If we can maybe look of, for of, we can look to governments as enablers of the multi stakeholders, like Nacho Jal, for example, it had a, an active role of governments as a way of like, enabling this multi-stakeholderism debate to happen. And I think um, there are already participation in multi-stakeholderism multi mechanisms, mechanisms, processes in the different um, areas of government, right? In the executive, in the legislative, in the judiciary branches. In all of them, the states usually have, or at least in Brazil and in, in 
in Europe, for instance, there are ways that we can think of like uh, third party actors to participate in lawsuits and so on. So can we maybe expect from governments that they should be enablers of this multi-stakeholderism and of um, internet governance as we thought of it in the first place? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm collecting the last question from the room. Uh, the gentleman uh, yeah, here, and then I will go through our uh, panelists uh, in the same order from Henriette, Milton, Juven, Wolfgang to Professor Jumbo, and then I will give floor to Dr. Uh, Dr. Feng to give the final closing remarks. So in five minutes, that's the plan. So yeah, gentlemen, please read okay. your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Sayed from the Iranian delegation. Uh, I'm advising the governmental bodies. Actually, I think uh, something that uh, is... Uh, uh, Excuse me, could you repeat uh, which delegation are you from? Actually, I'm advising the Iranian government authorities. Uh, Iranian? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a professor at the universities. Actually, uh, something that is very important for the governments uh, and uh, justifies the government intervention is the notion of the sovereignty. And if the government thinks that any kind of the the national sovereignty issues has been violated by the foreigners or transnational uh, platforms or uh, internet providers or something like that. It's something that the governments uh, should inevitably intervene in, the, in these issues. And uh, currently we have seen some kind of the media sovereignty violation that has happened uh, throughout the platforms, transnational platforms that they have uh, blocked, for example, by their corporate rules uh, against the national rules. And uh, those kind of the issues that has happened, digital sovereignty, media sovereignty, and particularly in, in, in times of the crisis, in times of crisis and conflicts are very much important for the governments and they can't, uh, 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 they, they, they can't uh, override themselves and not to intervene in those cases. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn to our panelists. Uh, each of you have one minute to summarize. You could uh, pick a question, you could uh, react to any comments, and really uh, one minute. Thank you. Milton, Milton has to leave, Zhang Hong. I think you should let him go first. Okay. Milton, please. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Henriette. And um, I think the only thing to say at this point is um, that the WSIS resolution regarding the roles of government uh, doesn't work. And uh, I think this was evident even when we were doing it, uh, but governments didn't want to hear this. But the, the idea that there is, uh, that governments make public policy and that the businesses operate and civil society kind of hangs around and, and says nice things, uh, this is the WSIS uh, definition of the different stakeholder roles, and it's it's wrong because, in fact, in the global internet, um, the multi-stakeholder community actually makes policy, and uh, frequently businesses who are operating their platforms are making policy, and governments uh, are participating in that in a different way. They are no longer sovereign. There is no sovereignty over the global internet. There is only territorial sovereignty. So these models, these traditional models of the role of government simply don't work in the internet space. And if we try to reimpose them, we're going to fail. Uh, so uh, we do need uh, innovation in institutions of governance. Thank you. And I'm sorry I have to leave. I, I've got a class. <laughs> Thank you, Milton. Thank you. So, Ariad. There's a very lively debate online as well. Um, I, I, I think that, that um, we need governments have a role. I think that's absolutely clear. They have a role at national level and they have a role at regional and at global level. As I said before, I don't, you know, the primary role is to, is to enable um the environment to create inclusive policy making processes so you know your point about ensuring multi-stakeholder environments but i think we cannot solve global problems with national solutions and i think it's just never going to work in fact it will create new 
problems. And I think this is what governments have to confront. And it comes to the question of collaboration. And I want to use one example. We have on the internet global companies that operate, that have business models that are very problematic from a competition and open market perspective, as well as from a human rights perspective. And for six years within the United Nations Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner, there's been an attempt to establish uh, an instrument on business and human rights, um, an instrument that could be used to hold multinational companies, such as the example that you've used, accountable for upholding rights. Why is that instrument not there yet? Why don't we even have a soft law? We have guidelines, but we haven't agreement on how to apply it as a soft law instrument, because powerful companies are blocking it. The US only joined in in the conversation on this treaty, I think this year for the first time, and that's progress. But they are reluctant to have global treaties agreed to, which they feel they would then have to be accountable for, for holding their companies uh, accountable for. And they feel that other states, other powerful states, they don't trust that other powerful states will follow the rules if there are new rules. And um, so that is why if governments want to solve global internet governance problems, they have to commit to work together, to collaborate, to try and build trust, no matter how difficult it is, um, they simply have to do it because we're never going to solve these problems by ideas of sovereignty, of territorializing internet policy and regulation. It simply won't work and it certainly won't work for human rights. Uh, thank you, Henriette. Uh, next uh, speaker, Jovan, could you please share your final remarks? Yeah, hi. It was an interesting online discussion. Uh, three major, major points. First, Leviathan, which is in title of this session, will have to exist. It is, we are not going to revise the human history of uh, at least uh, 30 centuries since the Hammurabi's law. Therefore, humans are humans, they have their own interests online or in situ, and that will remain that way. Whether it Leviathan will be a government or even tech companies, it is not excluded that we will return to the new feudalism of tech companies uh, delivering uh, rules. Obviously, it is not what I'm supporting, but Leviathan will always exist. Second point, I don't agree that there is no sovereignty of governments uh, over, over digital space. Unfortunately, in many cases, we are seeing that it is happening. And I always say that there are cyber crimes, but there are no cyber jails. That the people are arrested and the public authorities uh, with different motivations knock on the door of people and uh, and uh, apply the law in justify illegal way uh, over it, but that's, that's the case. And third point, which is the probably the major conclusion, all of us have to make trade-offs. Internet is a great enabler. It uh, enabled uh, many things, including Chinese prosperity, including prosperity of many societies worldwide, uh, individually, uh, corporatively, and on the national level. Therefore, we, all of us, have to make trade-offs. Yes, we may fragment the internet, but we will lose a lot. Therefore, this is a hard decision which parliaments, international organizations, individuals will have to make. Obviously, I make my decision. I am for an integrated, shared, and unified internet because it is an enabler for me, for organizations that I lead, for countries where I live. But many other governments and Excuse me, uh, what's happening here? The recording is not Sorry. Yes, so much you care. I don't know if you hear me or I hear you. Yes. Thank you. Well, that's it. Leviathan is around. Uh, there is a sovereignty over the digital space with good and bad reasons. And third point, we have to make trade-offs delicate. And... Uh, thank you, Jovan. Uh, we hear you uh, pretty good, actually. So a uh, last uh, speaker from panel would be Professor Zhongbu, and then I will invite Dr. Fang to give a few closing remarks. Uh, Professor Zhongbu, are you with us? Oh, we lose all our remote participants. Ah, uh, no. Professor Zhongbu, could you hear me?
okay uh yeah i am so <laughs> uh well uh, it's such a fascinating uh discussion and uh, not all the questions have an answer but asking the question the first step to discover it so i just uh, with some regrets uh, we i like to we have to close the session without hearing from our colleagues from China. But uh, I really think we all thank Internet. Without the Internet, we couldn't even hear anything from them. So thank you all for being here uh, until the last minute. I trust the discussion will be uh, go on and on on this uh, classic uh, question. Thank you.